explicit to describe uh, this interaction in a more uh, a multicultural uh, uh, milieu than you have done in the book. <coughs> I, I can give you, for, for, for example, yeah, if you talk about, you mentioned all those writers, Bruno Schulz, Carl Emil Franzos, yes, of course the Jewish religion, which uh, the Hasidis, which uh, occurs or is uh, 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 created by Baal Shem Tov in this area, yes. Yeah. Is it possible to understand this without taking into uh, 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 perception the <coughs> multicultural uh, uh, ethnicity and so on in this region? Well, well first of all, without question, uh, that this is just a common phenomenon, uh, primarily, though not exclusively, but really primarily throughout all of Central Europe, and here I mean from Poland and Lithuania down through the Balkans and Greece, uh, and then farther east in present-day Ukraine and Belarus. Standard situation until the 20th century. Virtually every city in this entire part of Europe whether it's Prague or Warsaw or Krakow or, or Budapest or, or Buda and Pest, all of them uh, were, almost, found, were almost, almost inevitably established by Germans because Germans were invited into, as I just said, by the rulers to make their kingdoms work better. Uh, and all these towns have, in, in the old days, German names. Uh, and then, aside from Germans, could be Jews in the northern tier, Armenians in the southern tier, Greeks, etc. The norm by the 18th and 19th century, completely in total norm, was that every city in this area were inhabited primarily by peoples who were different from those who lived in the countryside around. They were like islands, if you will. And it didn't make a difference with that, whether that island was Kiev or Lviv or, or Warsaw or Krakow, etc. Uh, and among <coughs> those inhabitants were, were Jews, but they were not the only urban no. inhabitants. They were, um, and it turns out that the, uh, the Ruthenians, the Rus population, the modern-day Ukrainian population, uh, they tended not to settle in cities, just like the Czechs tended not to settle in Prague. It was a German city, which they only recaptured, quote unquote, culturally in the second half of the 19th century. It's a typical kind of phenomenon. Uh, so, uh, uh, from that standpoint, uh, yes, this is, this is a multinational society. Uh, however, and these kinds of interactions and depictions are given in, let us say, this is an explanation, not an excuse. Let us say in my, uh, the big history of Ukraine, which is actually conceived as a multinational history of a land, but this book is very specifically about ethnic Jews and, and uh, pardon, as ethnic Ukrainians and Jews. It's, it's mm -hmm. not about all the peoples of Ukraine. No, I, I know. So from that standpoint, you know, we uh, be, uh, look how difficult it was to just talk about ethnic Ukrainians and Jews in one book. If we had to talk about also in this same book Armenians and Russians and Poles and Germans and Mennonites and Bulgarians and Romanians, etc., all of whom have lived for long periods of time on the territory of Ukraine, it would be an entirely different book. We singled out specifically these two people. Mm -hmm. now, this is clear for me that you can talk about all those. Mm -hmm. my, my, my reflections was that sometimes you use, for me, a bit often the expression Ukrainian Jews, yes, uh, uh, when it comes to people or Jews in this area, which are 
interacted with the other. Yeah? And this was my, my reflection. Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, you know, now you're touching on another matter, right? I know. I know where, I, now I think we all know where you were going, but we had to go around it. Okay. No, 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 no. No, no, that, no, no, that's okay. That's okay. That's good because you now... Uh, 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 Jews in the territory of Ukraine <coughs> never refer to Ukraine at all. Yeah. Not at all. Ukraine didn't exist. Well, actually, Ukraine didn't exist for most people until recently. Those people who come from the territory, Jews traditionally, who come from the territory of present day Ukraine, either refer to themselves or were known in the outside world as Russian Jews or uh, in more modern times Soviet Jews uh, or Polish Jews, right? If they were from Galicia, as an example. Uh, or if they were from Transcarpathia, they were Hungarian Jews. Right? They, they, they themselves referred to them, uh, used the uh, preface that it was related to the state in which they lived. And this is, again, not unique to, to Jews. The Mennonites only refer to themselves as Russian Mennonites and have always done so. And even their immigrant groups in the diaspora called the Mennonites from Russia. Well, the vast majority of the Mennonites were settled by Catherine II and her successes in the heart of Ukraine, actually on the island where Khmelnytsky's Cossacks were founded. Yet they called themselves Russian Mennonites. Well, all I would say is for as a historian living in the modern world today, uh, I decided to introduce the term uh, Ukrainian Jew or Ukrainian Jewry, Ukrainian Jews, Ukrainian Jewry, or Ukrainian Mennonites, uh, or Ukrainian Poles if they live on the uh, right bank, or Ukrainian Russians, if they live, and ethnic Russians who live in eastern Ukraine, or Ukrainian Crimean Tatars. Now, of all of those groups, probably the only ones who would welcome that adjective are the Crimean Tatars for a whole host of reasons. Mm -hmm. And the others wouldn't even think of it. However, however, my position is that the experience of all of these peoples whether they were Poles, or Russians, or Jews, or Germans, or Bulgarians, took place on the territory of Ukraine. Not in Bulgaria, not in Poland, not in, I don't know, Central Asia. It took place on the territory of Ukraine. So their culture, their views, their field their, is formed on that territory. And just because, in, just because they picked up a traditional name from a state that, had, that, they had exist, that existed in the past, well, now we do have a Ukraine. There was no Ukraine before. So then now we do. So I guess from my position, you know, let's catch up with the times. Let, let's, let's, you know, get with the program, as they say. Okay, thank you very much. So now we'll let in the, the audience to put questions, yes? Yeah? But they... One thing we, uh, perhaps we have to touch, and it is the Holocaust question. <coughs> because whatever we solve all other questions, this will remain the most hot topic between Ukrainians uh, 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 and Jews, I suppose. Yeah. So, uh, where are we today in this discussion about uh, uh, Ukrainian collaboration and not collaboration during the Holocaust? The view of European countries toward World War II and their role in the annihilation and murder of Jews has been a challenge for every European country since World War II. 
whether that European country is the Netherlands, which we consider to be very liberal, and did some not nice things during World War II vis-a-vis Jews, or Norway, uh, or France, or Italy, and certainly Germany. And all of these countries have faced this issue and dealt with it in different ways. Some, of the, some countries, as we say in English, took the bull by the horns and tried to deal with it right away, <clears throat> uh, make amends, uh, and then probably the best example of that was Germany. Uh, even a place like France was really far, far behind. We know that France has this kind of weird attitude toward Vichy France, where these things took place. It's not easy for them. The Klaus Barbie business was taking place not too long ago. So every European country has faced this in different ways and at different times. Central European countries, especially those that were under communist rule, whether as satellites, as Poland and Hungary, Czechoslovakia, etc., or within the framework of the Soviet Union, were not yet fully countries in the sense of the Netherlands or France or Norway or Sweden because they did not have control necessarily not to say that things would be different, but they didn't have control over the writing of their historical past, including the Holocaust and including World War II. There was a fixed narrative that was established by communist authorities regarding this matter. And so, and that fixed narrative was not necessarily sympathetic toward Jews as somehow being special they were just among the citizens of the Soviet Union or the citizens of Poland or the citizens of any other country, not singled out. But now, or since 1989 and 1991, the end of communist rule in these areas, these countries now are countries. Now they can face and do face their historical past. And quite frankly, their primary concern, not surprisingly, is not necessarily only World War II, and certainly not the Holocaust. I mean, their own histories and their own national heroes and their own narratives that were established in the 19th century could not be, have been spoken about during communist rule, the so-called white spots of history which needed to be filled in. the shooting in the head of how many soldiers, you know, how many officers in Katyn, this didn't exist. Well, then Poland after 1989 could talk about it, this is going to be high on their agenda. Well, as these countries are now having the opportunity to look at their own past, right, one of the issues that has come up in the inevitably uh, is the question of the degree to which citizens or residents of those countries, of whatever nationality, uh, participated, didn't participate passively, actively in the liquidation of uh, the Jewish populations. You know, some of these countries have advanced more than others, and some of them have advanced and then come back. Uh, and if we take the case of Ukraine, we have a whole, uh, th there, there is, there is, a Ukrainian, there is a Ukrainian national narrative that by definition is not concerned with the Holocaust and Jews because it's, not, it's only concerned, unfortunately, with ethnic Ukrainians. It's also not concerned with the fate of Poles in Ukraine who are also ethnically cleansed. 
It wasn't even all that concerned with the Crimean Tatars. It was a passive interest in the Crimean Tatars who were ethnically... Con now it's changed, right? Now they're all... Uh, so the Ukrainian national narrative has, has a lot of work filling in their own white spots. Um, and sometimes, just like Poles or Hungarians or any other patriots at certain periods of time, and we're going through that right now, are a little defensive. Why should we be talking about the Holocaust when you know five to eight million Ukrainians died during the famine 10 years before. Right? I mean, that, that's high on their agenda, which would make some sense. But having said that, there was also in Ukraine right now a, 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 uh, several younger, talented Ukrainian historians, male and female, there are institutes for the study of Jews in Dnipro, in Kiev, uh, in Lviv. Uh, there are courses now, even chairs of, of Jewish studies uh, in various places. Young Ukrainians going off to Israel to study Hebrew or Yiddish programs, which is very important. Uh, and they look at these matters in a different way. There's actually a, a very vibrant historical, historiographical discussion within Ukraine itself and within the Ukrainian diaspora about the role of ethnic Ukrainians and other people in Ukraine uh, vis -vis during the period of uh, the Holocaust. So, it is an issue that is being discussed, and there is no black and white, there is no one way of understanding the Holocaust today in Ukraine. Thank you very much, Professor Malgosi, for this last words about a difficult topic, yes. Before we end, I want to let in if there are some questions from the audience, yes? Down there, first. Thank you. Thank you, uh, professor, professors, for uh, very interesting presentations here and uh, uh, discussion. Uh, I wonder, uh, is there a so-called golden age of ethnic relations uh, uh, in, in the territory that we now call Ukraine uh, that you would like to encourage to be included in the historical narrative uh, uh, that could serve as a role model for, for future ethnic relations? Uh, some of my, although there's one colleague here which will probably say and say, well, of course, he, I, we know how he's going to answer that question uh, uh, simply because of my own uh, cultural predilections. Uh, uh, but there is, in fact, a golden age uh, uh, in the history of Jews and ethnic Ukrainians on the territory of Ukraine, and a golden age that is recognized both by Jewish scholars and Ukrainian scholars. And that golden age uh, was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, under the leadership of the Habsburg family uh, that ruled what we now popularly call Western Ukraine for approximately 150 years, from 1772 until 1918. Uh, and it ruled territories that are historic regions called Galicia, Bukovina, and Transcarpathia. And that when Transcarpathia was already part of the Hungarian kingdom, but uh, Galicia was just obtained from in the first partition of Poland in the year 1772. This was under Habsburg rule. One of the first things that the uh, ho uh, ho these were reformer reformer emperors, uh, Maria Theresa and Joseph II, who initiated a whole host of reforms in all areas, 
and that included an edict of toleration in 1778, I believe, or 1776, uh, which, um, uh, which ended uh, discrimination against Jews, and for that matter, against Catholics non of, the, of the non-Roman rite, so it, you know, it was across the board, and, and also uh, for the Armenians and, uh, and others living in that area. Um, by the second half of the 19th century, uh, after the revolution of 1848, and in particular after 1861, uh, uh, Austria, the Austrian part of the empire in particular, was a parliamentary democracy, ruled by an emperor, but with uh, with uh, representative bodies at the uh, county level, at the province level, at the national level. Uh, there were Jewish political parties. There were Ruthenian political parties, uh, both of whom very often cooperated with each other to weaken the role of Polish political parties uh, in, in, in Galicia. Uh, Book of Inna, historiography as you know the the, uh, 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 the paradise of cooperation between ethnic groups because all of them ha had legally uh, so many seats in the local diet of of Book of Inna, and in this case it would be uh, Romanians, uh, uh, Jews, uh, Ruthenians or Ukrainians, and Germans. Right? Remarkably, on the town square still today in Chernivtsi or Chernovets, you can see national homes, these big buildings, one right next to the other. You have the Romanian national home, the Jewish national home, the Ukrainian national home, the German national home, and very... In 1908, there was a great controversy among Jews as to what should be their literary language. In the Austrian Empire, they could function without any problem. But this was a question also in the Russian Empire. Of course, the Russian Empire was less tolerant, but the discussions were there. And what was the point? What, what is the Jewish language? for the Ashkenazim. Is it Yiddish, which was the spoken language that everyone used? Or was it Hebrew, which no one knew except some rabbis? But it had the prestige of being a liturgical language. And this was a big battle. And so intellectuals, Jewish intellectuals, decided, well, we have to sit down and have a language congress. We couldn't have it in the Russian Empire. Where did they have it? So the first language congress, the Jew, first Jewish, uh, first language, Yiddish language Congress, that's how it's defined, took place in Chernivtsi and not in the Jewish national home because the Ukrainian national home had a bigger auditorium. So was there a golden age? Yes, thanks to Emperor Franz Josef and the Habsburg Empire. Thank you very much. Are there further questions? Uh, my name is Ingmar Ulberg. I'd like to uh, hear something about uh, Stefan Bandera and uh, different views of him among uh, the communists and among uh, today's uh, nationalists in Ukraine trying to build up a national identity and also those who want Ukraine to, to adapt to uh, West European values, uh, human rights and democracy and so on. Uh, yes, uh, first about uh, a very brief biographical note on Stepan Bandera, uh, a young student of Ukrainian background, probably his father's ancestors were from Spain, that's a different story. Well, we do have a Spanish actor today called Bandera, do we not? 
from the females love him. Um, in any case, uh, this is a Galician family, a Galician Ukrainian family, Greek Catholic background. Uh, like many young uh, men in the 1920s, uh, got a an education. Uh, a university education, but then came the depression, couldn't get work. Uh, also, most Ukrainians, certainly intellectuals, were fiercely opposed to Polish rule uh, during the interwar years. There was a, a war right after, there was a new war after World War I between Poles and Ukrainians. It went on for six months, a full scale, full scale war, 1918-19. Ukrainians lost, became part of Poland. But Ukrainians were displeased. And so Bandera comes from that tradition. And he joins an underground organization called the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, whose goal is to overthrow Polish rule. Um, he is arrested uh, in 1934. He's put in a Polish uh, uh, internment camp. He was actually given a, a, a uh, and he was to be executed, but then they commuted it to life imprisonment. Poland, uh, Poland ceases to exist in 1939 as a result of the Soviet and, German, and Nazi German invasion. Uh, he's released from prison, by which time uh, he uh, had become a leader of one of the two factions of this organization of Ukrainian nationalists, because it was split. Uh, he was the leader of the more younger faction. Uh, and he never even went to, he wasn't even in, in Ukraine after the German invasion. And then his faction was, uh, de declared independence when the Germans came into, uh, into Lviv. They were immediately all arrested. And Bandera and his other cronies uh, spent the war years in the German concentration camp. So he wasn't even physically present. Uh, on the other hand, he became a symbol of those who, from their perspective, were fighting to liberate Ukraine. And many of them were under the ideology of integral nationalism. Integral nationalism meant that if we're going to build a Ukrainian state, it should only be for ethnic Ukrainians. And so we have to certainly get rid of Russians and Poles, who were the worst of all, uh, Jews, German, anybody else. Get rid of everybody other than ethnic Ukrainians. And ethnic Ukrainians are acceptable to us, <laughs> I might add. Uh, so uh, his followers, were those who participated uh, in military formations that were set up during the uh, Nazi German occupation of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, some of his followers uh, were entered into the lower ranks of the police, etc. cetera. Uh, however, in general, People outside the internal Ukrainian world labeled everybody a Bandarite or, or a supporter of, of him, whether they were or not. And some of the leading elements in Galician Ukrainian society already in the interwar period, let alone during World War II, beginning with the patriarch of that Ukrainian world. Uh, the head of the Greek Metropolitan of the Greek Catholic Church, Andrei Sheptitsky, spoke out, spoke out against the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, spoke out against the activity of people like Bandera and others around him, uh, spoke out against the liquidation of uh, and arrests of Jews. In the case of Sheptitsky, he had hid in his mon monastic network over 150 Jews and particularly young, uh, young children, the, the children of his rabbi friends, etc. 
Uh, so uh, this question of of Bandera and collaboration is not necessarily Bandera and collaboration, but the followers of Bandera, since Bandera was never even on the territory of Ukraine throughout the war and never never even returned. He, he, he was then released after the war from from a German concentration camp and then functioned uh, in uh, in West Germany until he was assassinated by a Soviet agent in 1957. Okay. Some other further questions? Or? If not, then I thank you, Professor no, Madoshi, for the possibility to have uh, pardon, this talk uh, with uh, you. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, 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 <laughs> Just one question. question. <laughs> oh, are we? I would just like to ask about the situation today of the culture between uh, modern Jews and Ukrainians, and how it differs from the historical past. Ah, yes, the pres the the the, uh, the present day. Uh, the present day, uh, I guess, I would uh, respond in the uh, following way. Uh, uh, on the one hand, there is not, there is no Jewish question in modern day Ukraine. And actually, in many ways there's no ethnic question in modern day Ukraine. Most particularly, people who were, uh, and even acculturated, no, even those acculturated in the Soviet Union, and certainly the generation in the post-Soviet time, do not and have not thought in ethnic categories. I know numerous people who came from uh, Central Europe and from Eastern Europe, and that includes Ukraine and Russia. They come to North America, and there is, they encounter something which they can't understand. Namely, in the diaspora, whatever the diaspora is, the primary question that you're asked is, you know, what nationality are you and, and, you know, what language do you speak? And these people come and say, what? <laughs> like, who cares? This, this, is not, this is not an issue in the homeland. Uh, you know, it's sort of like young people go out to a bar and one falls in love with the other. The first question is, is not, are you a Pole or are you a... <laughs> You know, you're an ethnic germ. It's, this, this is not even within the realm of consideration. And it's very important to understand. Um, however, from time to time, these matters do come to the fore. And it was another one of these examples of, there was reference to some, I believe you made an allusion to somebody who lives up in the north. What was his name? Vladimir Putin or Putin or something, something like, like that. that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, you got what I said when I said Putin. Uh, in any case, uh, he's done some very good things for Ukraine. First of all, as a result of uh, as a result of the, the Revolution of Dignity and the Maidan of uh, 2013 and 2014, he has helped make Ukrainians Ukrainian. He, he has transformed the, the vast majority of Ukrainian society, regardless of what their ethnic background is and what their language is, into people who are loyal to the state. For them now, Uk this, Ukraine is their country. And now we have these people invading it from the east and, you know, annexing territory. This is, you know, now, now they've woken up, actually. So this is an enormous achievement on the part of uh, Monsieur from the north. Now the other thing that he did was he brought to the fore a question, as I said, that wasn't a question. And that was the Jewish question. Because he, leading a state, very wise, very smart person, because 
he makes use of the media, the modern media, and communication facilities uh, in the way that previous leaders made use of military hardware. This is, th these, these are his really guns, so to speak. And he uses them very well. You know, RT and all the other, Ruski Mir, etc. So now comes this, this uh, uprising against the, the corrupt president of Ukraine, Yanukovych. Students first, it's led by students, like all great revolutions in the 20th, uh, in the, or going back to the French Revolution, were. And, uh, and this doesn't look good. This, this, this is a problem. This, this shouldn't happen. And so how is this uprising of people in Ukraine of various national backgrounds, by the way, the first person shot and killed on the Maidan was of Armenian background, mm -hmm. uh, a, Ukra a Ukrainian Armenian. Thank you very much. The second one was only from a Belarus. Well, there you go. So Ukrainian Armenian and a Ukrainian Belarusian. These are the first people who died for Ukraine on the streets of Kiev. And so Putin, what he tries to do is to play what we call the quintessential uh, anti-Semitic card. Namely, that all of these all of this is what's going on, because he figured you're going to get sympathy in the West. I mean, the New York Times is, is you're going to pick up these stories and so on and so on. So basically, this revolution has nothing to do with students, has nothing to do with the corrupt Yanukovych. It has to do with these fascists, these followers of Bandera, who want to, you know, create a now fascist regime, a uh, reactionary uh, uh, regime in, 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 uh, in Ukraine, and one of their characteristics is, is, is that they're already persecuting Jews. Well, he's talented. Sometimes he pulls it off. This one, he blew this one. Why did he blew this? Because already for 10, 15 years since independent Ukraine, a whole host of Jewish organizations uh, which are, you know, what we call NGOs, or like you. <laughs> By the way, when I walked in the door here today, I thought I was walking into the Jewish Cultural Center in Odessa, or in Dnipro. The only difference is they're twice your size. And they have everything, just like you. Schools, this, that, activity, well, whatever. They even sometimes have lectures by people like me. That's when they're really desperate. <laughs> uh, the point being is that trying to play the anti-Semitic card during the Maidan, during this revolution of dignity, brought out a reaction of the Jews in Ukraine who said, what is this? <laughs> and, and all of the leading organizations, there were famous guy named Yosef Zissels, who was a dissident sitting in camps, you know, a leader of the, of the leading Jewish umbrella organization, stands up on the podium uh, and speaks on behalf of Ukraine, that we, like all others, are fighting for our liberty and our freedom, then even had a major, an open letter, actually, to Putin, uh, which was published in the New York Times, and Al Haaretz, and Le Monde, etc., um, and then two weeks later, and ever since, we didn't hear anything more from Putin about anti-Semitism because he blew that one. The point being is, is that Jews are fully integrated within Ukrainian society today, so much so that they're willing to put their lives on the line. And there are many Ukrainians of Jewish heritage, regardless of their language, fighting on the Eastern Front. <laughs> Thank you so much.
that was that was that, 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 that was really very very interesting, and I really want to thank you very very much. And as I told, you, I hope this is just the first event in this very very interesting topic. Before you go home, you can listen to one wonderful piece of Miroslav Skor. It's Carpathian Rhapsody, which is made on a Jewish uh, folk melodies and Ukrainian folk melodies. And I think this will be the uh, nice ending for this very nice evening. So welcome. <laughs>
thank you very much to Irina and Wojciech for the great performance and again thank you for the great uh, event and thank you Natalia and Natalia for making it possible. And on behalf of Paidia Fogok School, I would like to also invite you for our next uh, events and uh, it's a study night Tikkun uh, Shavuot, May 19th and also we will have a closing of the semester and we will have a big event uh, May 29th. You are more than welcome to join and if you want to know more about the Paidia Fogok School and the courses which we are offering, uh, you can just uh, take the flyer and uh, we have actually, we open our registration for the next semester. So thank you very much and uh, hopefully see you soon.